So we will start. So I will um, read a bit of the, the simile of the soul. This is about loving kindness, what to do after the retreat. There's L there. This is called Kakka Chupama Sutta. Kakkaja is the so, Upama is the simile. It is in a section of many similes in this chapter, like snake simile and different similes. Thus have I heard, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, another Pindika's Park. Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Molia Bhagguna was associating overmuch with bhikkhunis, the nuns. He was associating so much with bhikkhunis that if any bhikkhu spoke dispraise of those bhikkhunis in his presence, he would become angry and displeased and would make a case of it. And if any bhikkhu spoke dispraise of the Venerable Molia Bhagguna in those bhikkhunis' presence, they would become angry and displeased and would make a case of it. So much was the Venerable Molia Bhagguna associating with bhikkhunis. So this is Majjhima Nikaya 21 talking about a monk who gets angry easily. Then a certain bhikkhu went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and told the Blessed One what was taking place. Then the Blessed One addressed a certain bhikkhu thus, Come bhikkhu, tell the bhikkhu Molya Pagguna in my name that the teacher calls him. Yes, Venerable Sir, he replied. And he went to the Venerable Molya Pagguna and told him, the teacher calls you, friend Maulia, friend Pagguna. Yes, friend, he replied, and he went to the Blessed One. And after paying homage to him, sat down at one side. The Blessed One asked him, Pagguna, is it true that you are associating over much with bhikkhunis, that you are associating so much with bhikkhunis, that if any bhikkhu speaks dispraise of those bhikkhunis in your presence, you become angry and displeased and make a case of it. And if any bhikkhu speaks dispraise of you in those bhikkhunis' presence, they become angry and displeased and make a case of it. Are you associating so much with bhikkhunis as it seems? Yes, Venerable Sir. Bhagguna, are you not a clansman who has gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness? Yes, Venerable Sir. Bhagguna, it is not proper for you, a clansman gone forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, to associate over much with bhikkhunis. Therefore, if anyone speaks dispraise of those bhikkhunis in your presence, you should abandon any desire and any thoughts based on the household life. So apparently getting angry is a household life thing. <laughs> <laughs> and herein you should train thus. My mind will be unaffected and I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for his welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. That is how you should train Paguna. So the Buddha gives to say something very remarkable here. If anyone gives those bhikkhunis a blow with his hand, with a clod, with a stick or with a knife in your presence, you should abandon any desire and any thoughts based on the household life. And herein you should train thus. My mind will be unaffected. If anyone speaks dis dispraise in your presence, you should abandon any desires and any thoughts based on the household life. And herein you should train thus. My mind will be unaffected. If anyone should give you a blow with his hand 
with a clod, with a stick or with a knife. You should abandon any desires and any thoughts based on household life, basically punching on your face. Even then, show loving kindness. And herein you should train thus, my mind will be unaffected and I shall utter no evil words. I shall abide compassionate for his welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. That is how you should train Paguna. Then the big blessed one addressed the bhikkhunis thus, because there was an occasion when the bhikkhus satisfied my mind. Usually in the first 20 years of his life he didn't have to imp, you know, promulgate any rules to monks because monks were naturally disciplined that they knew how to behave, they knew their purpose and they adhere to that purpose. So the Buddha says, you know, I had, they were, you know, they made me happy. <coughs> the idea here is that when he was traveling and teaching and there were those who were interested in that kind of teaching, they were already monks practicing and all he had to do was to just, hey, come join me. And they were, they knew how to behave, the, the culture and the way that a monk behaves. This is what happens at a time when a Buddha appears in a world that um, some other conditions are also present for him to start a sasana, that is a dispensation of a Buddha with four sangha, um, four assemblies, um, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, laymen and laywomen who are um, educated, who are speakers of the Dhamma. So you are not excluded from it. You are encouraged to be viyato visarado. You become learned and expert in the Dhamma and practice it as well as explain it to others. And only then a Buddha will pass away from the universe, from the world. Uh, he waits until that is completely happening and when he was abandoning his um, <coughs> lifespan, he decided that, oh, there is no need for me to hang around anymore because I see the four assemblies, are they are doing, doing what I told them to do. So that gave him a relief. Here I addressed the bhikkhus thus, because I, act, I eat at a single session, session, by so doing I am free from illness and affliction, and I enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. Come bhikkhus, eat at a single session, by so doing you will be free from illness and affliction, and you will enjoy lightness, strength, and a comfortable abiding. And I had no need to keep on instructing those bhikkhus. I had only to arouse mindfulness in them. Suppose there were a chariot on even ground at the crossroads, harnessed to the thoroughbreds, waiting with gourd lying ready, so that a skilled trainer, a charioteer of horses to be tamed, might mount it and taking the reins in his left hand and the goad in his right hand might drive out and back by any road whenever he likes. So too, I had no need to keep on instructing those monks. I had only to arouse mindfulness in them. He would say, just be mindful. Therefore, monks, abandon what is unwholesome and devote yourselves to wholesome states. For that is how you will come to growth, increase, and fulfillment in the Dhamma and discipline. Suppose there were a big sala tree grove near a village ta or town, and it was choked with castor oil weeds, and some man would appear desiring its good welfare and protection. He would cut down and throw out the crooked saplings and robbed the sap and he would clean up the interior of the gro grove 
and tender straight well formed sapling so that the sala tree growth later on would become would come to growth increase and fulfillment so too monks abandon what is unwholesome abandon the hindrances because this monk was getting angry and devote yourselves to wholesome states jhanas for that is how you will come to growth increase and fulfillment in the dhamma and discipline remember this morning delson mentioned the russian dolls remember that all the time you heard lotus russian doll many such things that you can keep like a pocket buddha in your heart all the time formerly bhikkhus in this same savatthi this is a story there was a housewife named vedehika and a good report about mistress vedehika had spread thus she is gentle she is meek she is peaceful now she had a maid named kali who was clever nimble and neat in her work and kali thought my lady is reputed for her patience is a uh, a good report about my lady has spread thus she is gentle she is meek she is peaceful how is it now while she does not show anger is it never the less actually present in her or is it absent or else is it just because my work is neat that my lady shows no anger though it is actually present in her suppose i test my lady <laughs> bad idea <laughs> <laughs> so kali got up late then vedika ask hey kali what is it ma'am what is the matter that you get up so late nothing is the matter ma'am nothing is the matter you wicked girl yet you get up so late and she was angry and displeased and she scolded then the maid kali thought the fact is that while my lady does not show anger it is actually present in her not absent and it is just because my work is neat that my lady shows no anger though it is actually present in her not absent suppose i test my lady a little more <laughs> another bad idea so kali got up later in the day and the same conversation happened and uh, and she was angry and displeased and she spoke words of displeasure so it's increasing now and then she tested her even more and she was angry and displeased and she took a rolling pin and gave her a blow on the head and cut her head this is actually how anger works remember the hindu story and i must add a footnote there that when people are so angry that you continue hating them they forget their way back to your heart please don't push them too far they don't know that you are a loving person anymore animals especially if you hate them hate them hate them you show them your dark side they will never want to be around you then the maid kali with blood running from her cut head denounced her mistress to the neighbors see ladies the gentle ladies work see what she did to me see how can she become angry and displeased with her only maid for getting up late how can she take a rolling pin and give her a blow on the head and cut her head then later on bad report about vedika spread thus mistress vedika is rough mistress vedika is violent mistress vedika is merciless what may have happened is that the maids got together and other maids said that you are working for the best person 
she never gets angry. So it entered into Kali's mind that, okay, no, she seems to be angry. Um, and, um, and then she started dwelling on that. Is it because my work is neat that she never shows it? Um, I must prove a point to the neighbors. <laughs> so <laughs> she got what, he, what she asked for. Likewise, monks, some monks look extremely gentle, extremely meek, extremely peaceful, so long as disagreeable courses of speech do not touch him. But it is when disagreeable courses of speech touch him that it can be understood whether that monk is really kind, really gentle, and really peaceful. I do not call a monk easy to admonish who is easy to admonish and makes himself easy to admonish only for the sake of getting robes, arms food, a resting place and medicinal requisites. Why is that? Because that monk is not easy to admonish nor makes himself easy to admonish when he gets no robes, arms food, resting place and medicinal requisites. But when a monk is easy to admonish and makes himself easy to admonish because he honors, respects and reveres the Dhamma, him I call easy to admonish. He sticks with the Buddha's advice that let go of five hindrances. Therefore, monks, you should train thus. We shall be easy to admonish and make ourselves easy to admonish because we honor respect and revere the Dhamma. That is how you should train us. Monks, here are, there are these five courses of speech that others may use when they address you. Their speech may be timely or untimely, true or untrue, gentle or harsh, connected with good or with harm, spoken with the mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. When others address you, their speech may be timely or untimely. When others address you, their speech may be true or untrue. When others address you, their speech may be gentle or harsh. When others address you, their speech may be connected with good or with harm. When others address you, their speech may be spoken with a mind of loving kindness or with inner hate. Here you should train thus, our minds will remain unaffected and we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness and starting with him we shall abide pervading the all encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train monks. So two things here. Here you start with the difficult person, <laughs> with the obstacle. And when you are done with that obstacle, you radiate loving kindness to entire universe. Because you all monks have all some training already. This is why we tell you to start radiating loving kindness in all directions uh, when you have done the practice already. Unless there was this co-worker or someone who was bothering you so much, this is the best thing to happen to you. That you have somebody like that to remind you of how much peace you have lost. And you can now re bring it back. In the retreat, everything is good. Food is good, good place, teachings, and everybody is supporting you. Then you can think that I must be enlightened. <laughs> <laughs> but be thankful for that person who is showing aversion. In other words, the Buddha says, show them compassion. They are needing that the most. Really. You are not going to break, correct them, or break into hate speech or defend yourself. It is not necessary. It is a waste of time. They are not going to hear you. 
how can they hear you when they have inner hate in them, when they have suffering in them? Their cup is full of suffering. All you can do is to radiate loving kindness to them and you will see and we have been reminding some of you in the interviews that when you see two people fighting and you are the third person near, you radiate equanimity, you radiate loving kindness in that direction. You will see very soon that loving kindness does the job. Not the languages, it's it's very limiting unless you know how exactly you should speak and be exactly kind and you are s your kindness is more than what is happening there but it's very rare that you are in that mind teach this to your children teach them how to hold themselves with loving and kind thoughts they will grow up to be wonderful kids and they will learn how to deal with these obstacles. This is very good. And the Buddha keeps giving similes here. Monks, suppose a man came with a hoe and a basket and said, I shall make this great earth to be without earth. He would dig here and there, stool the soil here and there, Spit, the, uh, spit here and there and urinate here and there. See, people do all kinds of things to you. And think, be without earth, that be without loving kindness. <laughs> be without earth. What do you think, monks? Could that man make this great earth to be without earth? If your gr loving kindness is great, greater than that hate, is it possible to undo it by a word, by just a little something, little you know, little tool they use to dig earth? It's impossible. Compare your loving kindness to this entire big earth. <laughs> and it can contain all the spitting, all the dirty language people throw at you. Someone can call you donkey just one time, and you go home and think about it. Do I eat like a donkey? <laughs> do, do I sleep like a donkey? <laughs> do I behave like a donkey? How many times is that? Three times. So that person only said it one time. And you said it to yourself three times already. <laughs> Don't let that happen. This is why mindfulness is needed. Somebody said you donkey, thank you. <laughs> Donkeys are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so two monks behave like that. Another simile. Suppose a man came with crimson, turmeric, indigo, and carmine and said, I shall draw pictures and make pictures appear on empty space. Is it possible? Monks say no. So be like empty space, like a mirror. All those images it reflects, it doesn't keep those images. So always radiate loving kindness. Another simile. Suppose a man came with a blazing grass torch and said, I shall heat up and burn away this river Ganges. Is it possible? No, it's so big. <laughs> So suppose there was there were a catskin bag that was rubbed, well rubbed, thoroughly well rubbed, soft, silky, rid of rustling, rid of crackling, and a man came with a stick or a pot, pot's herd and said, there is this catskin bag that is rubbed, rid of rustling, rid of crackling, I shall make it rustle and crackle. Is it possible? No, venerable sir. So same thing about loving kindness. Your heart is in a soft place. You are not suffering when you have loving kindness. You are not suffering when you have joy. It's actually those people who are lacking joy who hurt other people. That is so true. Think about that. They are lacking joy in their lives. They are nosy about other people's business. They want to correct others. They dwell 
thinking they meditate, but they are dwelling on you, <laughs> how bad you are and stuff like that. It's complete waste of time. They are lacking joy. They don't have good things happening in their lives, unfortunately. So what, what can you do? You don't give them a teaching, you just radiate loving kindness, compassion, equanimity and joy and wish that may this person find joy in their lives. Okay. And the Buddha gives an extreme simile. Monks, even if bandits were to sever, sever you with savagely limb by limb with a two-handled two -handled saw. Have you seen those big saws? Very long and you climb up a log, a log pavilion like thing and one is down below and they pull and cut, cut that uh, big log. So something like that. So now you are the log. You are being severed. Um, if bandits were to do that to you, he, he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching. Monks, you should train thus. Our minds will remain unaffected and we'll sh we shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for their welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate. We shall abide pervading them with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with them, we shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. That is how you should train monks. If you keep this advice on the simile of the soul constantly in mind, do you see any course of speech? trivial or gross, that you could not endure. No, Venerable Sir, therefore, monks, you should keep this advice on the simile of the soul constantly in mind. That will lead to your welfare and happiness for a long time. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So, one time this monk was getting ready to go to Sunna Paranta. I forget his name. P uh, Punna, I think. Yeah. Punna was his name. Like Punna actually means complete, full. And it's known that these people can be um, very harsh. And the Buddha wanted to actually ask, if, are you prepared to go here? And the Buddha keeps asking several questions. What if they, what if they punch you on your face and this monk says it's okay they they did not cut my limbs I will still be with them what if they cut your limbs it's okay I, they did not kill me I will still be with them and then you know this line of questioning and I summarized it but the Buddha says sadhu sadhu you are well suited you are very well prepared to go there go and Teach the Dhamma that is pure in the beginning, pure in the <coughs> middle, pure in the end. I may have mentioned this story one time. This Western monk was getting ready to go back to England after staying in, in Thailand for a long time. And this was the time that there were no many Thai monks in England, uh, you know, or monks living in England in general. And this monk started thinking, you know, are they going to, am I going to have any food, am I going to have a place to stay and all kinds of questions. And his teacher, apparently Ajahn Chah, asked him, are you saying that there are no kind people in England? So there will be people. Did you know that it's easier to maintain a monk in England than maintaining a dog? Dogs are very expensive, right? <laughs> <laughs> they need all kinds of things. Monks, just 
say, there is that floor, you can sleep there. <laughs> <laughs> it's really easy. So um, I wanted to bring up some other things um, to add this, add into this uh, conversation about radiating loving kindness. So the Buddha says, be like an island to yourself. This is, this is something he says repeatedly. Um, in an island, it is your safe place. You know, in the, down the creek, some of you go to that little island place <laughs> and <laughs> sit there, do uh, meditations, reflections, readings. So take that to your heart. You are safe in that island as long as you have four foundations of mindfulness or four sublime states in your mind. Four uh, Brahma Viharas. So um, in Chakravati Sihanada Sutta, he says this uh, Atta Deepa Viharata Bhikkhavi Atta Sarana Ananya Sarana. Be an island to yourself. Atta Sarana, you are your refuge. Didn't we say you are your own teacher? Mm -hmm. Ananya Sarana, there is no other refuge. So if you think that it is in that teacher, this teacher is good thinking, but don't have to get, you know, totally put your practice aside and wait until you see that teacher. Take the practice to your heart and see that it leads you onward. Dhamma has that quality. Open Aiko, it leads you onward. Reflect on that often. Dhamma will you know, Delson usually says, uh, trust the wheel of Dhamma, something like that. Trust the wheel, he says. This is the wheel of Dhamma that we discussed yesterday. It has been set in motion and it keeps going. And I don't know the reference for this, this but the Buddha has said, as long as there are monks who are practicing four foundations of mindfulness, the world will not be empty of arahants. And about four foundations of mindfulness, he mentioned a story about a little bird who was hiding under, um, what is the word for it, a little uh, a lump of soil. Um, and this big hawk was trying to catch the bird. Um, and hawk, a hawk actually managed to catch it because the bird was not under that protection. <laughs> It's like Mara catching you when you are not under the protection of the four sublime states. Uh, Mara tells, go wild and do anything and don't, and it's okay to break precepts and stuff like that. But then this bird said, oh, I forgot to stay in my safety zone. That is why I was in trouble. And the hawk said, I will still be able to catch you. There is no place that I cannot catch you. And the bird said, okay, release me and I will, uh, I, if you still catch me, uh, you, I will be your food. And the hawk released this bird and the bird went under that lump of soil, the puddle thing. And uh, as the hawk was approaching so fast, excited to capture the bird, it went hiding under that lump of soil and, and the hawk crashed and died. And uh, so the Buddha takes this as a way to say that monks, your inheritance, that what you inherited from me, I'm your father, what you inherited is the four foundations of mindfulness. You stay there all the time and no harm will come to you. In, that, in other words, nobody's speech, uh, nobody's, you know, um, he abused me, he did this, did that, all that will not affect you because you are in you are mindful about four sublime states. You are, you know, you are mindful about your feelings. You are mindful about your mind. You are, mi you are mindful about loving kindness. That is, you know, expansive mind. It is infinite. Uh, Mahagata mind. You are mindful about mental occurrences, hindrances, what is bothering you, and you can deal with it. Take the Buddha with you all the time. So about precepts, um, this is, is, I'm glad um, El asked that question in the morning from Delson. You will not be 
required to take eight precepts or nine precepts or ten precepts un unless you decide to. In Sri Lanka, on full moon days, people feel more spiritual. It's a tradition also perhaps because the Buddha became enlightened on, uh, on a full moon day. So people spend the day in the temple. It has been the tradition. And uh, not only on full moon days, every, um, every change of the moon cycle, they, they would go and spend the day in the temple listening to uh, Dhamma and practicing meditation. Because of the distractions nowadays, internet and all that, less and less people want to go to the temple. They want to listen to teachings from the TV and stuff. But uh, you know the ocean waves, the tides happen, um, rise, rising and falling happens with, with the full moon. It's like that. Some people may f have a strong spiritual connection like that. It's sp strong spiritual uh, you know, feeling to meditate with the full moon coming to the fullest. So. Um, People keep eight precepts on that day or ten precepts on that day, uh, 24 hours, and go back to five precepts. Um, bars are closed, so you can't buy alcohol, but people know this. Unfortunately, they buy beforehand. <laughs> 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 they, they party sometimes, you know, so that's, that's a side story. Um, but um, keep those five precepts sincerely. And um, someone asked about alcohol, actually. Uh, it's a tricky question because I don't want to be telling you to have alcohol. There's a story about that. That this, um, I believe it's a Zen story. This Zen monk thought that he was enlightened. And his teacher um, um, challenged him. His teacher said, um, I tell you these couple of things, and if you pass, um, you, you, I, I will take you as enlightened. So um, the teacher said, uh, look, there is that goat. If you kill that goat, um, I will take you as, you know, as a person who can be in mindfulness and kill the goat. You know, it's just a bizarre rule. And, oh, look at that pretty woman. If you spend the night in one room, um, without looking at her and without having any sensual thoughts, I will take you as enlightened. Or there is that bottle of sake, Japanese alcohol, and um, you can drink that. Um, so he chose alcohol. And the next morning he woke up, the goat meat on the table and the woman on in bed. <laughs> So if you, when you break that last one, you break everything. <laughs> you are not even enlightened. That's a lie. <laughs> so if you can avoid that, please avoid alcohol. Um, look at your intention. People justify wine and stuff. Um, look at your intention all the time. Um, and uh, make sure that you are not indulging in that kind of thing. There is alcohol in some cakes, some stuff, so it's, it, it can come in, you know, but they get, you know, neutralized. Um, yeah, stuff like that, so. But um, keep your precepts all the time. Be mindful all the time. There is a story about being mindful. Um, so there was this wealthy woman, and she had a gatekeeper. And she told the gatekeeper to be mindful that she has some business outside and she'll be back later in the day. So this gatekeeper um, thought he knew how to be mindful. So when the wealthy woman was away, some, uh, some burglars came in and um, he was mindful they came in. And they took this, the loaded the stuff into their long truck. He was mindful. They were loading the stuff. <laughs> and they took all the stuff. And he was mindful when they were leaving. And the lady came back. Everything was gone. <laughs> is this right mindfulness? <laughs> no. <laughs> mindfulness is actually taking action. <laughs> right, action. right action all the time. 
if you just let you know if, you know if you are not mindful you just lose lose what you have cultivated the wealth of dhamma that you have cultivated the buddha said if you have if you cultivate my uh, loving kindness to the extent necessary to the time it takes to do a finger snap like that that is a real person that is a real monk and same thing he said if you do the jhanas one of the jhanas or one of the attainments to that that moment it takes to make a finger snap he is a real monk he said read the achara sangata sutta you know it takes only that you know if you do and he even said that monk is free from all the debt whatever he owes to the lay people because lay people look after that monk by various ways requisites and everything and just that moment it takes to radiate loving kindness to the entire universe he is free from any loan he has taken i mean loan not that physical and financial loans but any debt he has toward anybody so loving kindness is that powerful i i remember david was reading this sutta one time um so um yeah keep your precepts and cultivate um uh, your loving kindness there is a little discourse uh, this is in anguttara nikaya satta jatila sutta and um, king kosala was right in front of the buddha and announced his arrival and was there and then these seven um, jatilas you know matted haired ascetics passed by and king kosala um asked the buddha you know is it possible to know that they are arahants by looking at them and the buddha said no it's not possible it takes a long time live with them for a long time before you conclude that they are arahants not with just um, one day or two days by looking at uh, a person looking at anything just uh, like that and uh, so to know their patience deal with them to know their resilience look how they deal with a troubled situation when they are in trouble to know their wisdom engage in discussion with them then you will know it so this is very very important now after that king kosala said indeed those guys who went by they are my spies they are not actual ascetics they are disguised and they go looking for stuff what is happening in the countryside so the buddha was right there that you know by looking at them just because they are dressed that way uh they have a mala they have a robe you know never come to a conclusion that they are fully there use this parameter and you will be safe and i learned this from uh, someone um, that when you have a teacher it's like fire if you get too close you get burnt <laughs> this is too much information right if you get too far away you don't feel the fire you can't you know actually use it so re- learn to respect the teacher but not wanting to re re get curious about everything that is happening in their lives this is you know they they can have their own lives and your job is to learn every teacher has something to give to you so you can have that loving kindness going toward that teacher who knows that teacher may be suffering in their lives that you, your loving kindness means so much to that teacher so that will be important to you in your life okay and there is this one last thing that is um about rules that one monk came and told the buddha now buddha had started giving rules and it came up to 200 something uh, now they have 227 rules and one monk said you know i can't i don't even remember any of this you know i'm getting fed up i'm going to quit the buddha asked can you keep one rule 
oh yeah I can keep one rule then watch your mind all the time that is enough don't have to remember all these rules so watch your mind all the time that means keep zigzagging keep zigzagging never forget zigzagging never forget to recognize release relax re-smile return repeat reinvent yourself rejuvenate yourself all the good hours add them all to you <laughs> and keep doing that relive your life to the fullest that you have experienced okay that's all for um, tonight any questions About 20 years after, when monks uh, had to um, be reminded of how to behave, basically, and there were some monks, uh, you know, whatever was agreed upon, they would break it. Um, one simple example would be uh, um, some monks uh, walked and uh, they walked very far barefoot and uh, they needed to wear some sandals. So Buddha allowed sandals and then this group of six monks decided to make sandals out of gold, out of wood, out of silver and it was disturbing because they walked with those uh, making noises in places where monks were meditating, tok 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 noise mm -hmm. and the Buddha then said monks don't do that just do something simple look at the need. Um, so about 20 years into his awakening um, only when there was a need when monk when a certain the first monk was always exempted from it he didn't know the rule and then the rule came that means it's, it's for, so this is for sang rules came for the convenience of monks sangha pasutaya sangha suttutaya for those monks who are living according to rules and so that they don't get the blame of the misbehavior of another monk so that is how rules came for the Nibbana, f to attain Nibbana. So it's, it's all compassion. That is why rules came about. And how many were there originally? It increased up to 227 and 311 for nuns. Yeah. Including those for monks and little extra. Because nuns had to be protected from a society that didn't know how to, you know, they, you know, if, if nuns were li to live in the forest alone, um, that would not be good. Um, so people can take advantage of those. So monks were told to stay close to them, walk with them behind or in front, so that they are monks are the protectors. Yeah. Yeah.